Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin, and today we're discussing the metaverse. The metaverse is a concept first introduced in the 1990s sci-fi novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. In this novel, which takes place in the future in Los Angeles, the metaverse is portrayed as the successor to the internet. Virtually all commerce, entertainment, and social interactions take place within this metaverse, which appears to users as a persistent urban environment developed along a single 100 meter wide road known as the street. Many sci-fi novels have built on Stevenson's original metaverse vision, including Ernst Klein in Ready Player One, he had the vision of the Oasis, and also in Dan Simmons' series Hyperion, he had the datum plane as his version of the metaverse. And while metaverse was a purely theoretical concept back when many of these sci-fi novels were written, it's safe to say that now in the year 2021, the metaverse is real and it's being built at a rapid pace. And while the metaverse is still a far way off from fully realizing the vision of Snow Crash or Ready Player One, we're already starting to see the effects of how the metaverse is changing our world. In this episode, we'll discuss what the metaverse is, we'll highlight some of the major platforms and technologies being developed right now, and we'll explore what the metaverse means for the future. Let's start with what the metaverse is and why it's a useful term to add to your lexicon. The word metaverse is different from the word multiverse or cyberspace, and it's important to draw a clear line of distinction between these words. Multiverse is the sum of all possible physical realities. Cyberspace is non-physical computer-generated realities. Metaverse, by contrast, is defined as a persistent virtual environment that includes the sum of all virtual worlds, augmented realities, and the internet. And there's three really important attributes to the metaverse that we should note. One is that it must be a persistent virtual environment. So for instance, a game like Call of Duty would not be considered a metaverse because each time you play, you start from scratch. You don't carry your experiences from one game to the next. You play one game and then it ends. The metaverse is more similar to a massive multiplayer online game like World of Warcraft where you do pick up right where you left off and you do have some continuity between the last time you played and this time that you're playing now. The second attribute is that the metaverse must be more expansive than any one company and than any one set of intellectual property rights. So World of Warcraft is not a metaverse company because it only has the property rights of World of Warcraft. By contrast, Fortnite is closer to a metaverse company because not only do they have their own intellectual property, but they collaborate with many other partners. So you can play as a Marvel character in Fortnite. You can also play as a DC superhero character in Fortnite. And you can play as Star Wars characters, Rick and Morty, and there are even real life musicians that will play concerts in Party Island in Fortnite. Travis Scott, Steve Aoki, they've all had concerts in Fortnite. So bringing together all of these different abstractions of the Marvel Universe and the Star Wars Universe and bringing them all together into one platform, that is what a metaverse is trying to achieve. The third important attribute to a metaverse is a portable avatar you should be able to be your same character in many different platform on many different companies virtual worlds and still carry your own identity your own virtual goods so you have some continuity just like you have continuity in the real world where you have your own identity and your own possessions in the physical world this is something that was not possible in the past but thanks to blockchain technology it's now more achievable than ever because of blockchain technology Every person can have a secure, verifiable identity that they can take to them on any platform, and they can have secure, verifiable digital goods in the form of NFTs that they can take with them to any platform. And there aren't a ton of great examples of this platform agnostic portability. We are really in the very early stages of this, but we're already starting to see some companies move in that direction, specifically Facebook and Microsoft. The recent announcements from Facebook and Microsoft are the main reasons why there's so much hype around the metaverse right now. It seems to be the most prominent buzzword that people are talking about on Twitter and in various tech circles. And here's why. Mark Zuckerberg recently announced that Facebook will switch from being a social media company to become a metaverse company. And here's how Mark Zuckerberg describes the metaverse as he sees it. Quote, 
What is the metaverse? It's a virtual environment where you can be present with people in digital spaces. You can kind of think of this as an embodied internet that you're inside of rather than just looking at. He also speaks to his vision of the metaverse when he says, quote, I think a good vision for the metaverse is not one that a specific company builds, but it has to have the sense of interoperability and portability. You have your avatar and your digital goods, and you want to be able to teleport anywhere. You don't want to just be stuck within one company's stuff. It needs to be an ecosystem, something that I hope eventually millions of people will be working in and creating content for, whether it's experiences or spaces or virtual goods or virtual clothing or doing work helping to curate and introduce people to spaces and keep it safe. So you can see Zuckerberg is really leading the charge to build this new type of oasis for not only Facebook, but for many companies to work in and contribute towards. Similarly, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella referred to their vision of building a, quote, enterprise metaverse, which would be sort of like a metaverse for people to collaborate with in working environments. So rather than going into the office or collaborating remotely, you could go into a shared virtual space and you can share data and you can look at graphics and you can have conversations and you can keep everything secure. This is, in many ways, how Microsoft sees the future of work. And when we take a step back and look at the broader trends, it seems like every billionaire tech CEO is either working towards exploring inner space or outer space. So obviously we have Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson. They're all focused on exploring outer space. Can we live among the stars? Can we colonize other planets? Can we take resources from asteroids and mine them and bring it back to Earth? Whereas other CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg, Satya Nadella, maybe also Tim Cook, they're looking to explore inner space. How can we build better virtual environments, virtual ways to collaborate with one another, virtual worlds that we can inhabit without ever having to live our own planet or even our own living room? And we've been seeing this really clearly since the COVID-19 pandemic started. Many kids had their first concert experience in Fortnite. And I'm sure it was just as valuable to them as my first concert experience was to me in the real physical world. Similarly, many teens have had their first dates via virtual dating app experiences. And many of our important life experiences in general are starting to take place in the metaverse as opposed to in our physical universe. We just haven't built enough immersive technology and we haven't built enough connections between these various digital platforms to fully realize the metaverse vision yet. Now let's start to talk about the future. How far along are we in developing the metaverse and what are the next stages of development? Well, to answer that question, let's look at the trends of what humanity has been building towards since we first came on the scene. And I'm going to look at five levels of achievement. Level one is survival. This is when early humans were wandering around the plains of Africa. They were nomads. We were trying to find food. We would gather berries, we would hunt animals, maybe we would build a fire to keep away predators, but really the game was about survival. I like to think of this as Minecraft level one. You don't even have any tools, you're just hacking away at trees and trying to gather some resources, and once you've used all the resources in one area, you move on to another area. This is level one, survival. Level two, I would call flourishing. You now have agriculture. You have enough food you can grow for yourself and your family. You also have domesticated animals, so you have a solid source of protein. And really, your whole goal is to flourish. You're trying to get more resources. You already are able to survive, but now you want to build a better life for yourself. Maybe you focus on building an even better house, a better castle. You start to build networks of trade with other bands of humans. This is level two, flourishing. Level three, I would call exploring Earth. Once we have really developed agriculture and we've also started to develop industry with the Industrial Revolution, now it's all about exploring Earth. We already know we can survive in most of these well-populated areas. What about exploring places like the Arctic or places like islands that are far out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? This is the era of exploration. There was also a lot of colonization during this time period. And I think a great example is the Wild West. If you were an American 100 or 200 years ago and you weren't sure what you wanted to do and you weren't quite happy with your New England life, one solution is to simply head west. 
If you head out west, there is an endless frontier of things you can explore, adventures you can undertake, resources you can harvest. And if you think about it, this was a really exciting time to be alive. Imagine living on a planet when not all of the planet has been explored. It's pretty thrilling to think about going to some new island that no one has ever set foot on before, or going up into the Arctic and not knowing what type of giant sea monsters you might encounter. This was an exciting time to be alive. However, that changed once all of Earth had been explored. Therefore, level four I call exploring inner space and outer space. Think of if you were born, which you were, after the time when all of Earth had been explored. We are literally living in a time where you can go into Google Earth and explore every square foot on the face of the planet and drop yourself right in there to have a look around. There is not really any mystery left in what's on Earth's surface. There are still some mysteries in what's deep underwater, for instance, but we know pretty much every square foot of planet Earth today. That's why in this current era of exploring inner space and outer space, people are focused on going beyond Earth. They're either exploring the planets, focusing on space exploration, landing on the moon, colonizing Mars, or they're focused on inner space, building virtual worlds, unlocking blockchain technology, creating virtual reality systems. And this is the phase we're currently in. We are exploring inner space and outer space right now. In other words, we are building the metaverse. Level five is the level we have not achieved yet. And this is really fascinating to think about. This is, I would consider, the level in which we are focused on exploring all conscious experiences. So imagine once we have a fully developed metaverse where you can essentially transport your conscious awareness to any conscious experience you would like to have, and it will be virtually indistinguishable from our own base reality. This would unlock an incredible array of possibilities. You could explore different places on Earth, different timelines. You could explore other types of universes that have different laws of physics and see what that's like. It's really hard to imagine what level five will be like, and it's likely that once it's achieved, we will also have an AI singularity type of event. And I'd be thrilled if we achieve level five sometime during our lifetime. And one of my favorite quotes that gets at this whole aspect of stages of development and levels of achievement unlock is someone was asked, why are we exploring space? And the answer was, because it's what's next. It's the next thing we're meant to explore. A lot of Luddites will try to go back to the good old days and, oh, why can't we all just have a little farm and raise chickens? And there's the cottage core movement that's all about that. But we can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. So I'm a big proponent of solar punk vision of the future where we have really high end sophisticated technology alongside environmental safety and well-being. So we have solar power, wind power, hydropower, clean nuclear energy, and technology pretty much disappears so that we can all be frolicking in the fields while still having everything managed in a systematic way thanks to our sophisticated computers. This is the future that we're building towards right now. Now let's talk about how the world's two global superpowers, China and the United States, are taking on the metaverse. And it's interesting to note that they have very different approaches when it comes to developing the metaverse. In the United States, if you ask anyone what they think of when you say the word tech or tech giant or tech company, they're probably going to mention Facebook, Google, one of these companies that is largely a social media company. It brings people together. Maybe it has advertising. It really is focused on entertainment, connection, bringing people together. And this has been America's economic focus since the Allies won World War II. We've switched from being in a manufacturing, industrial, defense, survival mode in preparation for the war to kicking back, making great content, creating social platforms. And that has been a major trend in the U.S. If you look at the charts, the U.S. dominates when it comes to consumer technology and social media platforms. Therefore, the U.S. is very focused on building the metaverse. It's pretty much our primary initiative when you look at the macro scale. China is very different by contrast. China never really got out of that mode of focusing on manufacturing, survival, defense, 
So while the U.S. has been kind of kicking back and focused on entertainment, China has continued to put forth a real effort to not only catch up to the West, but also to surpass it and to outcompete the West on virtually all dimensions, but specifically in real world, in manufacturing real items, in building atomic structures, in focusing on the world of atoms rather than the world of bits. In fact, there's the famous Made in China 2025 initiative, where China specifically plans to outcompete the U.S. in key industries such as manufacturing, clean energy, advanced robotics, agriculture technology, aerospace engineering, biotechnology, AI, infrastructure development, and beyond. Notice they didn't mention social media company or VR company or any of that. They are more focused on building real things for the real physical world. And they've also had some major consumer social tech companies, but they've recently had a crackdown on those companies. Ant Group was set to go public and it was going to be the biggest IPO in history. But then the Chinese Communist Party laid down the hammer and did not allow them to go through with the IPO. Not only that, but the rock star CEO of Ant Group, Jack Ma, who's sort of like the Elon Musk of China, he was put under house arrest, some kind of re-education environment, and now it seems like he has totally fallen from grace, and many of the other Chinese tech companies have been put on notice of who is actually in charge, who is actually calling the shots, and it is the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And the CCP is focused on continuing to drive the country away from focusing on the virtual world or the digital world towards focusing on the real world of building things, manufacturing things, creating good infrastructure. That's where they hope to dominate in the future. So the next question I have is, how are each of these respective strategies going to play out in the future? Is the U.S. making a big mistake by focusing so much on the metaverse and actually falling behind when it comes to things like building bridges and building infrastructure? Or will the metaverse allow us to emerge as a much more dominant center of collaboration compared to China? Let's talk about that in the future scenarios. Let's start with the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. For the worst case scenario, I'm actually going to explore three different worst case scenarios that each get progressively worse depending on what happens in the future. The first one is that the metaverse is achieved, but at great cost. Basically, we use the metaverse as a way to escape our own physical reality, and therefore our physical reality suffers. The environment suffers, global climate change becomes really catastrophic, our health suffers because of how sedentary we are. This would be a future similar to WALL-E, where all of the humans are overweight, they're sitting in their scooters, they're drinking Slurpees, they're looking at their screens 24-7, And much of the real world suffers because of all this focus on the digital world. That would be a bad scenario. The second worst case scenario, which is worse than that, would be that the metaverse is never achieved. That centralized control over a single platform by a single source of power wins over a decentralized approach. And this may coincide with a scenario where China becomes the dominant world power over the United States. And we could be living in a situation where the only metaverse style platforms are centrally controlled. So, for instance, you wouldn't even be able to look up Winnie the Pooh because some people have said that Winnie the Pooh looks similar to President Xi. And so if you're going to have a virtual world created by such a restrictive entity that won't even let you look up Winnie the Pooh, let alone Tiananmen Square or any other historically important event, That is a really terrifying future scenario. This would be like a big brother tech scenario, and I really hope we avoid this outcome. An even worse scenario than this, our third worst case scenario, would be a runaway AI scenario, similar to what Nick Bostrom has talked about in the past. And when we think about creating the metaverse, it's quite likely that once we fully achieve the metaverse and the metaverse is pretty much indistinguishable from our own reality, that may coincide with us achieving an AI singularity, where artificial intelligence systems are as smart as any human on all metrics, 
Not only that, but they keep getting better. So at that point, we hope that we have built out the proper value systems within them so that things will continue to get better and better thanks to their greater intelligence. But it's also possible that there will be some flaw in the AI's utility function. And it may end up leading to the extinction of humanity, not because the AIs are evil, but simply because their utility function wasn't quite optimized for human flourishing in the way that we would have hoped. I'm not saying this is likely, but we do need to consider the possible dangers of developing such advanced technology in the future. Now let's talk about the best case scenario. Best case scenario. Best case scenario is that we create the metaverse, we fully realize the vision, and we unlock level five, which we talked about earlier. Level five is being able to explore any conscious experience we would like. We can explore any time, any place. We can connect in any way. We can even explore alternate types of realities. And at this point, we may actually emerge as a higher dimensional being. It sounds totally crazy to even say those words, But think about the cells in your body. They all emerged as one person, as us. And Alan Watts talks to the fact that on a long enough time scale, that's what human society is doing. Think about from the very beginning where there's all these separate tribes of human nomads, and then eventually you get these big cities. And then after the world wars, you have this global civilization. And now we're moving beyond our physical civilization and we're going to outer space and we're going to inner space we are in some ways emerging as a higher dimensional being. And once the metaverse is fully realized, once AI singularity is achieved, maybe we will literally escape the space-time continuum that is beholden to the arrow of time from the past to present to future. And maybe we will literally be able to go sideways to alternate realities. We could go backwards to the past, forwards to the future. In Hyperion, they have this really awesome concept called stim sim which is stimulation simulation and this is a quantum technology where you can literally go into different times such as the 1400s when the english with the english longbow were fighting against the french and you can experience a battle as real as the reality you're experiencing right now and so in the book hyperion the soldiers actually use this stim sim as part of their training. So not only do they train with modern weapons, but they can train back in English longbow days. They can train in you know, the Civil War America days. They can train in any place and time that they have a record of. I could imagine a future where we have a similar capability, where you can truly experience any conscious experience that you'd be curious enough to pursue. Now let's bring it home with the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. My most likely scenario is best summed up as the only way out is through. I think it's true that we are damaging the environment by focusing so much on the metaverse today. All of the energy required to mine lithium and cobalt and other precious metals out of the earth is detrimental to the planet. And all of this focus on the digital world is adverse to human health, both our physical human health, because we're so sedentary when we're on our phones and computers and gaming consoles, and for our mental health, where people are being fed misinformation, disinformation. There's some toxic bullying that happens online because you have that disconnect between being behind a computer screen. However, these may be growing pains that are necessary for us to get to where we need to go. And I believe that as long as we keep the ecosystem open and we don't censor people's ideas, people's speech, and we allow people to collaborate, eventually we will create a better system of collaboration and cooperation among all the nodes in the network, among all conscious human beings. And over time, I think we will get far better at noticing misinformation, disinformation, and we will be smarter about our mental health and our physical health. And I feel very optimistic that we will create more joy, more human flourishing, so long as we can keep to our fundamentals, allow for an open ecosystem, and do not neglect either the virtual world or the physical world. Both are important for the future of humanity. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for tuning in. 
and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.